Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, wherever you're joining us from. Thank you for being here and, and welcome. My name is Gaston de los Reyes. I'm director of the Center for Social Impact and Innovation with Glasgow Caledonian New York College. Uh, I'm delighted to introduce you to uh, Umut Korkut, who is professor of international politics at Glasgow School for Business and Society at Glasgow Caledonian University. Professor Korkut is also head of European Union funded projects for the WISE Center for Economic Justice. Now, receiving his doctorate from the Central Uni European University in 2004, Professor Korkut is a member of the Executive Committee of the International Political Science Association, an expert in Hungarian and Turkish politics with a recently published book on politics and gender identity in Turkey. Professor Korkut studies how political discourse, aesthetics, and visual imagery create audiences in a variety of contexts, including political regime change, gender politics, populism, and migration. Professor Corkett is a prolific and widely cited author with over 100 por uh, publications and nearly 1,000 citations, and is currently leading multiple research projects sponsored by the European Commission's Asylum, Migration, and Integration Fund, and also the Horizon 2020 Fund. Above and beyond all that, Professor Corkut supervises a half dozen doctoral dissertation and is director of studies on management, international relations and democratization, sports and social integration and productivity themes. We're so pleased that Professor Corkut could set aside time to join our resilience and reconstruction series with the Center for Social Impact and Innovation and look forward to your presentation on authoritarianism during COVID-19, addressing themes of governance and accountability that have become so pressing during this pandemic. Uh, as a reminder to our guests, you're encouraged to submit your questions by clicking on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, and I will present your questions for discussion after Professor Corkut's presentation. Thank you again for joining us. Thank you very much, Gaston, and thanks for introducing me with such nice words. Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, <laughs> wherever you are. Um, so let me just turn this thing on. Okay, so as Gaston kindly introduced me, I'm a professor of international politics <clears throat> at Glasgow School for Business and Society. And I also have a role at Y Center for Economic Justice in Glasgow. Um, I've been at GCU for more than 10 years now. This is my 11th year actually. Um, I made my career there. Uh, so I, I went there as a lecturer and then here I am a professor, you know, doing a few different things. Um, uh, and uh, you know, giving talks here and there every now and then as well. So this talk uh, was actually, it really reflects our times in terms of uh, the timing, in terms of where I am, uh, in terms of, you know, like ad hoc, uh, you know, solutions to various crises that, that we face and we've been facing and we will be facing uh, all throughout this pandemic. So when, when we first started discussing about this, you know, this lecture, I, I suppose it was last spring, um, it was that it looked it looked as if then uh, authoritarianism was going to be on the rise uh, in certain countries in terms of how they respond to the pandemic. But since April or, or May, lots lots has have happened, um, and then practically beyond authoritarianism, governance started to be uh, an extremely wanting issue. <clears throat> um, I started to approach this uh, theme of governance, you know, from uh, its implications on on, on citizenry. And how it how it how it really um, uh, affects our everyday. So more and more, I started to question issues such as accountability, responsibility, cosmopolitanism, and solidarity in terms of um, in terms of how uh, the the citizens or the public can meet the demands of ad hoc governance uh, that that practically aims to respond crises. Um, so here I am, I mean, rather than practically reflecting on authoritarianism, I think it makes more sense now to talk about governance because at the end of the day, I don't think that the, the issues uh, that we face in terms of accountability, responsibility, and solidarity does not really permit much of a difference in terms of democratic and authoritarian governance any longer facing the pandemic. So let me just start with um, presenting uh, my, presenting uh, the uh, kind of framework of this uh, of, of this talk. So I'll be talking about complexities of governance uh, amidst crises, and then I will discuss practically in order um, governance challenges, and uh, I will reflect on how to construct uh, and convey the new normal 
as uh, that has become uh, the catchphrase. And then I will also try to reflect on who, what, which should have a priority um, when we are you know, reflecting on governance challenges to respond to the pandemic. And uh, I will I will ask you know um, kind of wide conceptual questions such as how to establish solidarities while we're going through the crisis that the pandemic unleashed, uh, whom to hold accountable, who should be responsible, and then what kind of governance in the end. Um, just to give you a clue, actually, while I'm reflecting on these things, I'm going to take you towards to my own terms because more and more I'm becoming convinced that governance is something that happens through constructing joint narratives, uh, especially in, in, the, in micro communities that affect the everyday of citizens and in terms of how they interact with each other. So while I'm going to raise these very, very macro kind of questions, such as how to establish solidarity, whom to hold accountable, etc. At the end of the day, I will take you to my own terms and I'm going to reflect on the importance of micro and everyday in order to, in order to reflect on, in order to respond to such wide conceptual questions. So hopefully <clears throat> you're going to enjoy this lecture. <coughs> Excuse me. So this talk actually in the beginning was going to reflect on uh, a special issue that uh, a public jurist, um, a, a publication that comes out, that came out from uh, in Hong Kong, uh, Hong Kong University, um, brought together to reflect on uh, Viktor Orban's uh, illiberal democracy in Hungary uh, in June 2020. Uh, basically, during those times, it looked as if the, uh, the authoritarian countries or the illiberal countries were there to exploit the coronavirus emergency in order to legislate in a certain way to curb um, uh, in individual freedoms and then um, to encroach uh, into people's private uh, pr private lives. Um, it looked it looked as if uh, the authoritarian countries and you know non-authoritarian countries, let's say, were going to pursue different routes uh, dealing with the coronavirus emergency. Uh, so by the time you know I started discussing this thing with Megan and then with with Gaston um, uh, over over last year. <coughs> uh, things started to change. And I'm going to explain why things started to change. And I will say that things start to change because, you know, simply because of the um, ad hoc uh, kind of uh, governance um, required in order to respond to uh, uh, to the crisis that, that became unmanageable for the governments. Um, so moving on from uh, illiberal or uh, authoritarian countries, I started to see that certain issues uh, that, that deals with governance were pretty much shared across uh, various uh, political systems, regardless of how democratic or uh, undemocratic they are. But simply uh, the politicians, they ended up you know, being a kind of responsive, reactive, without thinking too much about how these decisions started to encroach into the private life uh, of the citizenry. So that's the reason why I decided that, you know, we have to move, move on from uh, discussing um, coronavirus or crisis management or crisis governance um, along the, the terms of illiberalism or authoritarianism. And then we have to, we have to uh, practically come up with, with ideas such as what is the impact of uh, uh, crisis governance and how we can set the terms of crisis governance. So what are the uh, governance challenges overall, um, regardless of the political system at, uh, uh, at, at uh, right now? Um, so we, we're seeing new patterns of inequality and prejudice. Uh, prejudice will be something that I'd like to reflect on um, a bit more as we go along this presentation. Um, <clears throat> we're seeing new patterns of segregation, um, new experience of space and contact. Uh, this became extremely crucial practically who, uh, how, how we're defining the safe space, how we're defining the terms of you know, safe contact with, with the other. And that from there, I'm going to reflect on cosmopolitanism. It is something that uh, I, I truly believe in. And I'm going to reflect on whether crisis governance that, that has been put in place ad hoc, in an ad hoc fashion um, all throughout, uh, how, it's, how it is really affecting uh, cosmopolitanism. Then I will raise, uh, uh, you know, new definitions of accountability, solidarity, and responsibility um, amidst the coronavirus crisis. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then finally, I'm going to you know, reflect on this general question such as, do these factors even permit much difference between democratic and uh, authoritarian governance uh, any longer? 
So this, this is practic these are practically the terms that I'm raising here and then the concepts that I'd like to reflect on as we go on with discussing uh, uh, governance during crisis and then uh, uh, reflecting on various uh, conceptual terms that requires revisiting and then re-understanding as, as we're facing with ad hoc uh, decision-making amidst a very, very big uh, crisis. <coughs> So let's start with um, governance challenges again. So coronavirus pandemic has, a, has illustrated how radically socio-ecological risks can transform the everyday lives of citizens. I think it is really, really quite obvious right now that our the everyday uh, or, some, or, or the mundane uh, that we got used to have completely changed since the coronavirus pandemic has started. Um, lockdowns have, have shown both the enduring strength of public solidarity and the potential disruptive impact of misinformation, such as fake news, illiberal populist narratives, but also poor government communication in emergency situations. <clears throat> um, there has also been very delicate bonds of trust between governments and citizens, which became app apparent, and then these show that issues of preparedness, risk awareness, and responsibility apply to policymakers just as much as the public. So um, for the first time, perhaps, um, uh, the difference between policymakers and the public disappeared as the policymakers started to hold the public accountable rather than what we used to in, in traditional political systems or democracies, whereby the elected officials are held accountable uh, by their voters. So. I suppose these are really, really like wide and extensive and then also shared challenges across uh, various political regimes. And that's the reason why we need to go beyond looking into authoritarianism versus democracy and then discuss practically how governance is challenged as a result of the coronavirus crisis. Now, some, to reflect on the literature, I mean, crisis and disaster create complex challenges for governance as they destroy human lives and dignity. So rather than governing only through risk, leaders are now governing through uncertainty. Um, I think this is quite an important term here um, to underline. At the same time, leadership during disaster is more challenging because citizens are more anxious <clears throat> and less tolerant of hazards uh, to their way of life. And many people feel vulnerable, but different segments of society are differentially affected leading to social conflict. At the end of the day, all groups in society feel that they were at risk, but cannot agree on what counts as risk first and foremost. So I suppose um, uh, as we go along with this presentation, we will see that the only, the, the only risk uh, is not necessarily the health risk. Uh, practically your risk perception depends on how vulnerable you perceive yourself vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, the, the coronavirus as well. So that's the reason why I think what we're going to see more and more is, is, is uh, practically the difference or the divergence between people's perception of risk in terms of where they straight themselves on a vulnerability, let's say spectrum, in terms of how they conceive themselves to be possibly or probably affected by the coronavirus crisis. So wh where does this leave us? Um, I, I want to start with solidarity and then, I, uh, then afterwards I'm going to reflect on responsibility and cosmopolitanism and then finally I'm going to reflect on accountability because I believe that these are the, the three conceptual pillars that we need to revisit in order to understand how governance um, uh, 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 the mitigations of governance, let's say, and what kind of governance uh, will be institutionalized uh, or will be consolidated with respect to the coronavirus crisis. Um, I suppose these, let's say, really traditional terms of, of political science really require uh, reconcentration in order to understand practically the challenges of governance amidst the pandemic. So the solidarity um, assumption, which I want to question is uh, as follows. While the pandemic hits the elder generations more indiscriminately, the young generations are asked to sacrifice both economically and socially as lockdowns hit their economic and social activities. So this is also the generation that has also felt you know, the brunt of the 2008 economic crisis in terms of job security and ac access to housing. So we still don't know actually how you know, this crisis is going to affect uh, the young people by the time we're, on, we're, we're out of the pandemic situation. Um, it will be highly crucial to follow uh, how their political reactions to sacrificing their futures to protect older generations that are extensively considered to be financially more robust given pensions in Western Europe and house ownership structures. Uh, 
In this case, the governance challenge is uh, practically how to make sure that we protect the most vulnerable, but recognize the social, economic, and personal needs of those that call themselves less vulnerable. If you will, I'm not really saying that you know young people are less vulnerable. I like to call them as people uh, in, in a category of you know people who are calling themselves less vulnerable, because at the end of the day, we still have a lot that we don't really know about this coronavirus crisis, but we know that some people, they perceive themselves less vulnerable at the face of, of the pandemic. So I just want to make this you know, um, differentiation quite clear that there is a certain section of the society that's feeling themselves more vulnerable vis-a-vis uh, -vis the pandemic in comparison to those that feel themselves less vulnerable. And I believe the, polar, the, the, the polarization that we're going to come across as we go through the pandemic, perhaps if we reach the, the end of the pandemic, will be the polarization between uh, those feeling themselves more or less vulnerable and in terms of how they are going to organize themselves. So I suppose the, the, the solidarity issue here will be how to reconcile people's perceptions of vulnerability and how to make sure that you know, while we are uh, protecting um, um, uh, those who, who classify themselves vulnerable vis-a-vis at the coronavirus crisis, um, uh, we're, we're trying, we're still making sure that people who conceive themselves as less vulnerable to coronavirus, but more vulnerable in terms of their economic, personal, or their social, social needs are served. So reconciliation of practically perceptions of vulnerability will be quite important. And I believe this is the reason why, you know, solidarity as a theme will be more and more questioned. <clears throat> Um, cosmopolitanism, this is something extremely important for me, uh, given my background, and I'd like, to, I'd like to reflect on this thing because I think cosmopolitanism also has uh, responsibility, uh, kind of implications in terms of what we ask from the other uh, when we go through um, uh, uh, this, this crisis. And then I'd like to actually raise this question in order, to, in order to make a statement that this is going to be a governance challenge. I'd like to call, once again, people uh, in our societies as mobile and non-mobile. I don't want to really get into these terms as like migrant, foreigner, you know, or local or, or citizen, etc. Because I think these terms do not really make much sense any longer because uh, people, let's say that if you put people across a spectrum of mobility all their lives, I believe that it, it is much easier to make a differentiation across people in terms of how mobile they've been vis-a-vis uh, uh, vis -vis those who have not really left the place that they were born, uh, they were born at all. Um, I suppose uh, the pandemic makes a gap between those mobile and non-mobile ever more acute. I mean, we, we, we saw this thing in terms of people's reflections on, on migration, but I suppose from now on, the, the, the divergence of people across this um, mobility spectrum will be even more pronounced because to those who are mobile, will be looked at um, uh, uh, with, with frustration, perhaps um, uh, with, with danger, uh, danger perceptions as those who are likely who are prone to bring uh, the virus uh, back to non-mobile communities who would like to remain local. But I mean, at the end of the day, we cannot really you know, keep on living without being mobile ever because societies, uh, they need mobility in order to progress. So, so the gap has been affecting uh, people's positions or on where they stand on migration, but the pandemic creates a much deeper polarization between the proponents of localism and cosmopolitanism. And the politicians are, are also increasingly portraying those who travel as a threat. But there's an overall ignorance of why some people have to travel, even if they are not key workers. And we can put in that category uh, those people um, who have families, spouses, partners, friends, etc., in foreign countries, and who need to go and see them, who need to go and spend some time as part of their, you know, care, take care giving journey. So, if you portray those who travel as a threat constantly, in that case, I, I think those people who are not mobile and who have not been mobile all throughout their lives, they will, they will really lose this kind of understanding, let's say, of the needs of the foreigner or, or the other in their societies. There is also an overall ignorance why some people have to travel, even if they are not key workers. So politicians and the public need to avoid derogatory language, which does not recognize the need to travel for some, despite the pandemic. Um, and then this is going to remain as a governance challenge practically, how to balance the safety for the non-mobile majority while making sure that the mobile majority are not disparaged. Um, I, I believe, I mean, in Britain, for example, when you look into the discourse, Increasingly, 
the discourse uh, is becoming really disparaging across those who are not really traveling for leisure. There are some people who travel for leisure. I suppose this is not really acceptable, but I mean, there are still some people who have to travel uh, during the pandemic. And I don't think that these people should be disparaged or they should be put in the same situation as those you know, who travel for, for leisure reasons. So in that case, you know, how we can really understand the life of the other, how we can really appreciate the need that some people, they have to, they have to continue to survive with, with, with two legs in two different countries, et cetera, while you know, we are reflecting on our safety, on our security is really, really important. And this is a governance challenge in terms of how to balance practically safety while not you know, disparaging uh, the mobile minority. Um, accountability is another issue which I like to reflect on. Um, so, you know, overall, you know, so far in democracies, you know, uh, what we know is that the elected and appointed are accountable uh, to the public for their actions. So this has been at the very, very bottom of our democratic systems. Yet during the pandemic, it is this time the politicians that keep the public accountable for their actions. Um, such as, you know, you cannot do this, you cannot do that, et cetera, et cetera, with the idea that if you do that, you, will, you are damaging or you are, or you are um, affecting uh, adversely uh, the majority. So then the political class and the society starts making us accountable for our actions. But given the ad hoc nature of decision making amidst the pandemic, there's an ever changing picture of needs and musts, uh, which, which becomes practically really like blurry in terms of what is acceptable behavior. Because acceptable behavior is defined in haste by politicians by holding their publics accountable. And while this, this thing is going on, there's not much deliberation and what, whatever, whatever is acceptable can change overnight. I mean, that was Britain uh, right before you know, Christmas, um, rightfully, uh, one would say, given uh, the fact that um, there was a huge increase in terms of, um, in terms of uh, the virus, but I mean, nonetheless, in this kind of a very blurred structure of uh, what is needed to be done, what is acceptable acceptable to be done, then the accountability structures are becoming very, very complicated. And that in this case, you really run into danger of, you know, while you, you, you'd really do your best in order to follow um, what is really required against, against, against the pandemic, you practically still may end up in a position that you are failing in your accountability to the public and to the political class. In that case, how can you really maintain compliance and avoid confusion in established structures of responsibility and accountability? Because our established structures of accountability have been holding our politicians accountable, but right now actually our societies and our political class are, hold, are holding us accountable across you know, a very, very ad hoc kind of decision-making process. So this is, for, for me, I believe this is a, a governance problem as well. Now, so in terms of the governance challenges, uh, I said you know, solidarity, cosmopolitanism, and accountability um, were uh, uh, the most important issues. And then um, I, I also stated in the beginning of my uh, presentation that I would look into reflecting on you know, my research and my belief uh, in, in micro communities and um, setting, uh, 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 setting the everyday as, as, as a place where differences can be mediated. So how do we separate narratives? Um, uh, how, how do separate narratives, sorry, how do separate narratives become common narratives in this kind of research? Our hunch is that to an extent that people can acquire the ability to reflect on each other's lives, they will start common narration of their everyday articulation. So um, this, I believe, uh, goes beyond sympathy. It, it practically requires you to like to, to uh, uh, require to have empathy in order to reflect on each other's lives. And then thereafter, you understand practically the needs of the other rather than looking uh, to the other with disparaging terms. So what do we know so far? I mean, in this literature, narrative literature is extensive. It refers to such themes as national, na nation building, gender, way of life, etc. So we suggest that to an extent that the process of common narrative building challenges the existing narratives, what appears as different uh, communities could become common narrative communities through articulations of their everyday. So finally, we argue that however limited the subject of the narrative changes in comparison to their earlier self, it is still important that they take part in seeking articulations of common, common everyday narratives with the other. So what is really important is that we recognize the other in terms of seeking 
common everyday uh, narratives and articulations of these narratives. Um, at the end of the day, the articulations of the reality of the real people uh, serve as a device to stimulate particular lineages of thought. That is, the arrival of challenges in everyday within publics acquires a priority within the existing realities to inform a new articulation of everyday. Uh, most of the time, we have to understand that people are just trying to get by. Um, I mean, people may be failing this, failing that, etc., at the face of ad hoc uh, decisions, or else people may be really, really scared, and they they feel that the decisions, the, the political decisions, are not really sufficient. But we have to understand that people are most of the time just trying to get by. And I suppose if if we have this common understanding, then our uh, considerations of solidarity, responsibility, and um, cosmopolitanism uh, and accountable, et cetera, will gain a new kind of conceptualization whereby we start at least reaching out to the other. And then we try to understand actually why and how they, 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 they consider themselves vulnerable amidst the pandemic. And then that would be uh, the beginning of a governance structure that reflects on the micro and, and everyday. So facing the new reality both embeds the new narratives in the everyday um, and stimulates manifestation of new narratives as the new and common uh, uh, everyday narratives. So how can we uh, in that, sorry, lost this thing. Okay. Um, how can we improve our understanding of governance considering um, uh, the pandemic and cons uh, considering uh, the ad hoc uh, kind of decision making that has become characteristic of this uh, pandemic? So we have to start with exploring the existing narratives for both for those that do feel and do not feel vulnerable. So for the time being, um, uh, vulnerability is, is defined practically in terms of the, uh, uh, the, the pandemic. And I suppose this is right. Um, uh, while we're going through the pandemic, we have to understand that you know this, this this can really kill some people. But as we get as we as we continue across uh, this pandemic journey, we will see that other kinds of vulnerabilities will, will start to, to increase. And I, I try to reflect. Um, uh, uh, if you want to create this vulnerability spectrum, and if you want to create practically who feel themselves vulnerable and then who feel themselves less vulnerable um, across the spectrum, we, are, we, will start, we will start seeing that there are multiple vulnerabilities that, are in, that will be involved um, in this process. From there on, we have to present deliberations within each narrative community in terms of who feel themselves vulnerable, who feel themselves less vulnerable, et cetera, to those who would otherwise not hear, uh, not, not hear each other's narratives. So we have to give voice to communities, and then we have to uh, formulate these communities in terms of you know, their feelings of vulnerability and also the characteristics of vulnerabilities. We have to concentrate on the everyday articulations of hardships between those that feel vulnerable and those who feel themselves less vulnerable or do not feel vulnerable or who, who feel that they have other vulnerabilities. And the basis of such crisis governance during the pandemic should be built on joint narratives depicting the extent of vulnerabilities without judging the other by the predominant definition of what counts as vulnerable vis-a-vis -vis the vulnerability of the other. This could in the end prevent governance failure that does not so far recognize the expanse of the solidarity spectrum, mobile and non-mobile uh, conflict, and accountability and responsibility shift uh, within the polities. Um, thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, P Professor Corkut, for that wonderful presentation. Um, I'm uh, pleased to remind our, our audience that you are invited to share your questions through the Q&A tab, which you can um, uh, press the button at the bottom of your screen. And we have a question to, to get things going from our colleague in New York, Michelle Gabriel, on the theme of polarization in feelings of security versus insecurity. And in particular, she asks uh, about the, this differential sense of security, looking back at uh, the financial crisis of 2008, certainly the COVID pandemic that we're facing, and how you see this correlate with uh, trends both at the national and global level relating to income inequality. Uh, and do you think that the, um, the, the divisions that arise from income inequality uh, are correlated or influence this differential sense of security? Thank you for the question. I mean, this is a very difficult question because 
my reflex, my background is in European politics, so inevitably my reflections will be uh, on on European and Western European societies. So um, I know that obviously, you know, the crisis, the financial crisis, the economic crisis, or, or, or what you have, is felt uh, in multiple fashions and multiple formats in in so many different places. But there is no way, really, I can have a grasp of how you know various, uh, let's say, countries or geographies would really experience this. So when I'm talking about these things, um, I have to apologize, but I can only reflect on you know Western Europe. Although it will be quite interesting to discuss how these concepts would apply to to other parts of the world as well. So uh, in terms of Western Europe, uh, in, and in terms of income inequality, and in terms of financial crisis, etc. Uh, what we saw was uh, practically with, with 2008 and then um, the, the economic crisis taking hold was uh, the fact that there, was, there became an intergenerational um, uh, kind of um, differentiation in terms of how people experienced and how people were influenced by, uh, by the financial crisis. Um, it was quite, you know, it was quite obvious that people who were, who were already in uh, kind of safe jobs with their pensions uh, guaranteed and who were in the mortgage ladder with some, you know, um, established funds, etc., um, they were not really as influenced by the 2008 crisis as the others who were entering the job market at that stage, or else who had to really um, find their way um, in the mortgage market and then um, settle uh, on a permanent job uh, with a pension and all that. So I believe, uh, although it is still quite early to say that the, the pandemic at the moment or the health crisis is going to practically make uh, this kind of uh, difference even more acute, um, especially considering the fact that well, we, have, we still haven't seen the unemployment yet. Um, well, I mean, in Britain at least, uh, many people are furloughed. Um, uh, we don't really know what kind of you know, taxation or what kind of job cuts, etc., that we will have to we will we will have to experience by the time the pandemic comes to an end. But I, I have a feeling that actually. Uh, uh, this can really this may this may replenish the uh, the inequality that has started the intergenerational inequality let's say that has started after 2008 crisis and then this may simply be yet another kind of um, uh, kind of challenge um, to uh, the feelings of intergenerational solidarity across uh, various age groups. Th thank you uh, for, for, for that answer. It's, uh, it's, it's fascinating to hear you organize politics among generations. I think that that is uh, certainly under, under theorized and under considered, uh, but crucial here. Uh, we have a question from one of our guests about uh, looking for the, the success stories. Um, are there uh, countries, whether they're democracies or otherwise, that you think have risen to the occasion in their ad hoc responses to, to the pandemic? And, and if so, what is it that they're doing that uh, seems to be working well. Um, I don't think that there are success stories yet. I mean, in the beginning, um, in, in Britain, we were hearing uh, from health officials that it is still too early to say what's the success story. And then there, you know, we were really suspicious and we were like, well, look at the, the figures uh, of mortality in Britain and then compare them in Germany and then look at Sweden. I mean, they seem to be able to go out, etc. Whereas look at us. So in the beginning, I think, I, at least I was not really too convinced that um, that it was really too early to say like what, what which country is successful, etc. Um, but more and more, actually, I'm coming to appreciate that this is really a very very long process, and there are just too many factors to this long process. Um, I mean, mortality rates obviously is an extremely important issue uh, in terms of how daily the virus has become in certain places such as Britain and United and US. But now we're seeing that actually, well, these countries are quite successful in terms of delivering the vaccine, right? But I mean, nonetheless, delivering the vaccine in Britain, uh, I think in Britain to a, to a larger extent in comparison to the US is not going to solve uh, British problems because Britain is really like embedded with the rest of the world, like more, you know, more closely um, than the US. I mean, at the end of the day, there are so many holders that cross from the continent into Britain. Now, <clears throat> you may say that, for example, look at New Zealand, look at Australia. Um, they don't really have any COVID whatsoever. But at the same time, they have no immunity either. Um, and look, like, it, it would be actually, it would be really, really surprising if coronavirus hit, hit New Zealand, because it is so far from everywhere. It can really close its borders, and they don't really have a cross-border cross kind of haulage uh, you know, traffic. Um, uh, that that they rely on. So, 
like is really closing a country off like a success i don't think so um uh, i think uh, the success story would be while opening your borders still trying to uh, restrict um uh, the virus and then you know uh, making it um, not as challenging uh to public health <clears throat> and i don't think that you know new zealand has really succeeded this yet and unless they can you know go through a very very fast vaccination program will it take them two years three years etc until they open their borders and is this really a success story I, I don't think so so obviously if you look if you approach this thing from like mortality only we would say that um countries where mortality figures have been really low are really successful but if we approach this thing from a, a, a more longitudinal kind of process and then we start thinking about various other vulnerabilities and then consider uh, mortality as perhaps the most important aspect but still not the only aspect of this process then we have to we have to practically reflect on what is successful governance considering in a, a considering so many different dimensions and we i don't think that we're there yet um, however, I don't also I don't obviously want to um, undermine the success of keeping mortality away uh, from certain countries. Very good, uh, th thank you. I mean, it's uh, we're figuring out how to evaluate success as we uh, watch the phenomenon unfold, and uh, so we've got moving targets in theory and in, and in practice. We have two of our guests asking questions about the, uh, the relationship between the pandemic and, uh, and authoritarianism. One just wonders about uh, whether you've, you see that the shift from local to global is one of the drivers of the, the, the rise of uh, authoritarianism. And then another uh, question, our colleague in, in New York, Michael Cohen, uh, asks about the, the tendency for um, people to sometimes prefer security over uh, political freedom and how that, um, that, uh, that trade-off um, under the gun of the pandemic uh, may have been one of the sources of a rise of, of authoritarianism. So the questions about the rise of, of authoritarianism, this trade-off between personal security and freedom, and then the local to the global. These are fascinating questions, um, and I don't think that I will be in a position to, to respond to them unless I think um, uh, about them uh, for a bit. Um, but I, I mean, these are really, really fascinating questions. Uh, so thank you for raising them. Um, uh, the, the simple response is, I don't know. Um, I don't really know to what extent people would be ready to forego their freedoms in order to make sure that um, they live a, in a safe and secure environment which is really sealed off and i'm not really too sure how free you would be even if you know you're living in a commune which is really really sealed off from the rest so i suppose at the very very micro level this depends on what you feel is uh, is the most important in your life but what i uh, what i reflect so far or what i think thus far is that um you know feeling of somehow uh, risk is really, really important for us to progress. So if we progressed thus far across the centuries, it was thanks to us taking, taking ch chances, uh, perhaps you know, um, taking certain risks, and that's how we progressed thus far. Perhaps a vaccine may also be part of the story. But the legacy of this thing, especially with respect to Michael Cohen's question would be, that people would, would, would really lose that feeling of like taking a risk or taking a chance, then we will enter into a low-risk society. We may, I don't want to say we will, we may enter into a low-risk society where people are not really taking risks and they are really staying safe and secure, but at the same time, not as progressive, not as innovative any longer. So while we discuss practically the balance between um, safety and security and freedoms, we also need to think about how an imbalanced, safe and secure, and then you know a free, unfree kind of a system would have an impact on uh, us taking a chance and then being innovative. So um, that's the thing. The other thing is actually how to micromanage risk, um, because so far um, we delegated micromanaging risk to our politicians. 
And then so far, you know, we're just watching the news every day. In certain countries, the politicians are applauded. The other countries, they are dispersed, etc. But the, so the, the, uh, the politicians, they started to micromanage risk uh, effectively. And this is not really, this is not really recognizing uh, thus far the, the whole expanse of risks and whole expanse of vulnerabilities. I mean, thus far, it's only reflecting on health as an issue of risk, health as an issue of vulnerability, et cetera. But I mean, nonetheless, the politicians or the political class will need to be so influential, so inter interfering in order to you know, continue to micromanage all kinds of risks that are involved as we, we start to see that along with the uh, uh, health, along with health as a risk, other types of risk are going to kick in. So my, you know, quite, my response is that I really don't know. It's a process that we need to watch, but I think it's not really as simple as you know, balancing you know, freedom and, and security. But I mean, if you balance freedom and security or if it's unbalanced you know, towards sec security in that case, how are we going to maintain our innovativeness, our progressive character, et cetera? Because we need, we need a certain level of risk in order to take a chance. Now, that was the other question which you were asking. The, the, other, the other question was about uh, to what extent does this, the shift from the local to the global uh, mm -hmm. uh, have the influence upon the, the rise of authoritarian governance? It's, it's, a very, it's, a, it's an excellent question. I mean, so thus far in my research and um, the research that involves uh, people working with me as, as Glasgow Cousin University, we, we try to put our kind of trust in the fact that if you can really influence, have a sway, on micro communities, on how people, um, they, they operate, they cooperate, et cetera, uh, and then they share their everyday, then you can make a change on, on macro politics. So this, this has been thus far, you know, our, our interpretation, but like, as much as I want to believe still on this narrative research on, on the importance of the micro, I believe that even in the micro now, we're going to come across such deep polarizations because depending on practically this you know, vulnerability spectrum in terms of how you perceive yourself vulnerable and then how you perceive, perceive yourself not, not as vulnerable. So, so thus far, you know, as political scientists, we reflected on macro polarization at the, at the macro level, but continuing on, we may start to see you know, polarization at the very, very micro level in terms of your, your perception of your own you know, uh, vulnerability and then the shape and type and the character of vulnerability that you associate yourself with. So if this is going to be the case, I believe authoritarianism will really find really receptive audience within certain micro communities and it will just replenish itself. But I mean, it, it, it may also be that certain libertarian micro communities may really you know, start coming up and they may really, really feel themselves frustrated if politicians are there to follow only um, the lines of those who feel themselves extremely vulnerable. Now, what would be the challenge? I think the challenge is to have responsible governance um, and responsible politicians who are there to listen and who are there to understand, appreciate once, once again, mortality levels are down because I mean, as long as mortality levels are so high, I don't think that we're there yet. But I mean, when we get to that stage, a responsible governance would be there to understand, appreciate the expanse of these vulnerabilities across the spectrum and then reflect on these in order to come up with policies. This may be an authoritarian government, this may be a democratic government, but at the end of the day, coronavirus shows, that, shows us that if governments deliver, then uh, they, are, they, are, they are rather popular. Uh, th thank you indeed. And I would just like to acknowledge um, as a parent how challenging it is to uh, compare and evaluate differential vulnerabilities and risks. So, uh, you know, is it riskier to uh, uh, encounter the, the, the school or, or is it riskier to, to skip the school and stay home? For, for children, we, we, we have a hard time um, evaluating those questions and, and therefore they become very uh, vulnerable to the narrative construction that occurs through social media and, and through politically uh, divided uh, policies. Our, our colleague, Gordon Jack, um, uh, uh, wants to emphasize uh, the, your, your point about the construction of everyday narratives and, and observe that uh, during the pandemic in the US and in Europe as well, we've seen a huge expansion of so-called fake news narratives that, uh, that mobilize this uh, polarization. Um, and, and so then you get these mirror image sense of vulnerability. I'm vulnerable because uh, you're forcing me to wear a mask. I'm vulnerable because you're not wearing a mask. Um, and so the, the, the question that, that Gordon poses is, do you think that we have a, a realistic prospect of, of constructing 
shared uh, common everyday narratives and and how what's the path there? I, I think we are not there yet because once again, as long as mortality levels are too high, I think the priority is really to curb uh, mortality. Um, uh, but I mean, my PhD student uh, works on uh, you know, fake news uh, in terms of populism. Um, so when I'm talking about these things, I'm pretty much reflecting on his work. Um, I suppose fake news or certain myths, they, are, uh, they will always find um, their audience. So this is you know, beyond, uh, beyond the coronavirus, um, regardless of coronavirus, let's say. And then people at the end of the day, they believe in what they want to believe. So this, this may be conditioned by our social uh, background, our education, but at the same time, even regardless of these things, you may really want to feel yourself better and that you may want to see those news that may, that, that may make you better. So if, if we cannot really interfere in making people responsible, like when it comes to decide, deciding what they want to believe, right? In that case, I don't think that we can really ever kind of bridge the difference between those who want to, who want to believe in those fake news that will make them uh, like safe and those actually who really follow, who think that they follow real news, but they think that, you know, real news are really kind of disparaging or uh, kind of disappointing them. Like wear a mask, not wear a mask. I think this is really extremely clear, but we, we lost our reasonable, reasonableness, let's say, like very reasonable people that you would really think that these people, they will never be, you know, at the radical ends of politics, etc. They They are bought in to fake news because they just don't want to do something. And if they don't want to do something, they practically watch those news that will make themselves, that will allow them, let's say, not to wear a mask. I don't think anyone enjoys it, but I mean, at the end of the day, there's, there's a difference between not enjoying it and that, you know, propagating that this is really, this is not really good. Why are we wearing that? So once again, I think it is too early to say, I just want to replicate, you know, this, this motto that the public health officials were saying, but this yes. is a question which requires further deliberation and thank you very much gordon for asking this question um uh, excellent um uh, w w one one more guest has a question from from the, the u.s perspective I, we've been talking about authoritarianism and other forms of, of government from the standpoint of their capacity to deal with the, the risks of the pandemic and their capacity to hinder or promote innovation but i think in the united states many have a concern with authoritarianism as a as a problem in itself and uh, the, the question that is posed is, um, even though we saw potential uh, authoritarianism getting arrested through a democratic process uh, following the, the last election in the United States, um, uh, this, this guest uh, says we shouldn't assume that we aren't risked at, at further movement in that direction. And, um, and, and is asking if you might be able to help us uh, identify the kinds of signs and uh, uh, warning signs that we are at serious risk of that shift from uh, a more democratic government to a more authoritarian one? I think uh, what I call, and what, what literature also calls is eco chambers. We only listen to those you know, who, who, who feel the same way as we do. And um, this, uh, this certainly demolishes all narrative communities or all you know, joint narratives or joint belongings, et cetera, that I've been propagating here, you know, once again, reflecting on my PhD students' work as well, I need to give credit to them, um, that we are really stuck in our eco-communities, um, regardless of being in America or being in Turkey or in other place. Once again, as long as we want to hear, we, we want to hear wh what we think is true, what we think is right, we have no time to reach out to the other and then listen to the other's story. Now, this may be the case in certain countries which are coming from less uh, democratic backgrounds, uh, more in comparison to other countries which have, you know, more established democracies, etc. But what is really like disappointing is that uh, more and more the countries with like, like better established democracies are also falling the trap of uh, um, having publics that are really, you know, distributed across so many small echo chambers that may be intersecting with, with each other here and there, but then will not really be there in order to understand, try to appreciate each other's stories, each other's narratives. So the worrying signs in America is uh, practically, um, well, I mean, uh, the Capitol building had been invaded and all that. I think it is, it's quite worrying, etc. But people, they really believe in their actions. 
And then people, they don't want to question and they don't want anyone to question their actions. So there, there became a certain situation where rationality has to be reconciled with irrationality, you know, in terms of not only with coronavirus, but in terms of how polarized we are, that rational people are, are expected to reach out and then to understand the very, very irrational kind of beliefs that, that you cannot ever really justify. And if these irrational beliefs, which are really embedded in echo, echo chambers, are not really appreciated, then people, they really take their guns and they take their thumbs out the streets. So I suppose you know, social media had been a facilitator of this thing. Um, social media, I mean, everyone says this thing, I don't want to repeat what everyone says, but I mean, nonetheless, what happens now is that we, we do our job and then in the evening, um, we just sit in front of social media and we talk to like-minded people. We give out about this and that and then we just have applause, likes and stuff. And then it becomes 11 p.m. and we feel like, oh, it's been such a great day. I've been so active today and you know, I'm just saying everything. But I mean, nonetheless, this does not really make you an activist because you just, you may not really care what's happening at your doorstep. You see what I mean? That because the comfort that social media provides is just your couch and then that makes you remain in your echo chamber and then just look down the, at, at the other as someone irrational, right? So this is, I, I don't really know how to answer this thing, but I think varying signs are there and they're there to stay, uh, stay as long as we really go through a, a revolution whereby, you know, we have to once again appreciate the other and then the other may be right. Like perhaps, I mean, in, in European politics or Western politics, the Second World War had, had brought this thing and the Holocaust um, you know, brought this thing that what happens to the other if we don't really you know, accept them as, as human beings? I don't really want to, I don't want us to go through another Holocaust, obviously to come to that stage, but now there's something drastic and radical has to happen in world politics so that we can come to that, this stage. Thank, thank you so, so much. I mean, uh, we're, we're having uh, conversations in political philosophy that have been had for thousands of years, um, and we're we're having them with the uh, variables of incredible technological change that changes the playing field dramatically. And of course, we're under the gun of this uh, pandemic. So uh, though we could keep uh, going, we we should recognize the hour. And and thank you so much for 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 sharing your insights with us, uh, Professor Corcutt. I'd I'd like to give you the last word and thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Thanks for being here tonight. Okay, wonderful. Thank you everyone for, for attending and we look forward to seeing you at our next uh, Risk and Resilience session. Bye-bye.